Hey everybody, welcome back. We're going to do a lecture on biotechnology and the genetic modification of food, and this kind of fits into the vein of what we've been talking about the last several lectures, where we started with soils, we got into traditional agriculture, the origins of, of modern agriculture, I should say, got into traditional agriculture, organic food is a possible solution, and another solution has been applying biotechnology to the food supply. And this is a very controversial solution to a lot of the problems that we're experiencing, and we're going to talk about um, how biotechnology and genetic modification go hand in hand. Um, you might come out of it with more questions than answers. Uh, you might go into it with solutions that work for you. Either way, we're going to have an interesting discussion on it, and hopefully it won't be too long. We'll just get through it, and I think you're going to enjoy the information that comes out of it. What we see right in front of us, uh, just starting off, is genetically modified tomatoes. These are This is a photograph I found right online. Uh, it fits perfectly with the whole concept of this lecture, which is tomatoes that are have had an alteration done to them. Uh, in this case, the tomatoes are resistant to, uh, if I can recall, they're resistant to uh, certain pests that would come in and, and eat them up, so they require less, or less herbicide. Um, they're, they're hardier, which means that they could survive harsher summers and drought conditions better. So we'll get into how they bring that about here in a moment, okay? But these are tomatoes, people eat them. You probably, many of you have eaten these and probably had no idea that they were genetically modified. So let's talk about what biotechnology is and genetically modified food. So biotechnology is simply the application of biological science to creative or, or to create products derived from organisms. Um, and it seeks to scale up the technological aspects of agriculture. So biotechnology is a huge field. Um, the, the amount of investment that's going into it these days is immense, especially in the um, agriculture and biomedical fields. Where we see a lot of the biotechnology being applied uh, specifically is in genetic engineering. So genetic engineering is the direct manipulation of genetic material through adding, deleting, modifying DNA. And so here we see a artist conception of this idea of genetic modification where we see the, the double helix of the DNA molecule being modified and adjusted with something new coming in. Okay, um, that's that's kind of a good representation of what genetic engineering is. It's about taking and manipulating the genetic material so that you get new outputs or new results as a consequence. Genetically modified organisms are called GMO. These are things that have, have been genetically engineered using something called recombinant DNA. So we usually think of DNA as something you get from your mother and you get from your father and you combine the DNA of those two sources and you wind up with essentially you. Um, recombinant DNA works a little bit different. Recombinant DNA is DNA that is patched together from multiple organisms. They don't even have to be from the same species. They can be from completely different species. Um, so recombinant DNA is, is one of those things that people feel a little strange about. Um, there's some positive aspects of it. What we've gotten out of it, biotechnology has created medicines, it's cleaned up pollution and dissolved blood clots. And we'll get into how that can happen here in a moment. But the way that they do it is pretty straightforward. They have a desired gene on the DNA, and then they have uh, a bacterium that, they, that has the ability to store this DNA on it. So here's a recombinant DNA. This is a, the, the, what we call a plasmid. And what we do is we snip this in and it's stored onto this ring. This ring of DNA is then put into the uh, desired or into the bacterium, which is then inserted into the original plant cells. This bacterium then has the ability to put its DNA in there for replication and the resulting plant cells have those features that are desired in that foreign DNA. So that's how it works. Um, it's actually not difficult to do. Um, at the college where I work at, non-major biology students actually engage in a lab experiment where they do exactly this. It's not difficult to do. It's not considered high tech any longer. It's very interesting and it's something that can be done very easily. By the way, when we take this DNA and we transfer it into another one, it's referred to as a transgenic uh, relationship. So in this case, a transgenic crop is mod genetically modified to be more useful to humans. The bacterium transfers from the T DNA, which is this up here, um, from the, pl the, the plasmid fragment with the desired gene into the host plant's nuclear genome. So what we're seeing here is taking this, putting it in here, and then this feeds it into the plant. And so the plant then now has that genetic code within it. 
So genetic engineering is like, but it's also unlike traditional breeding. So traditional breeding uh, changes organisms through selective breeding or the same of the same or similar species. So, you know, if you take a, uh, uh, let's say a, a donkey and a horse, they're very similar, right? They're not the same species and you can get offspring that comes from it. That's a type of breeding. And of course that breeding would, or that offspring would be a mule. Um, and we usually do this where it works with entire organisms in the field, right? So we're, we're, we're constantly bringing the genes together in a natural process. Uh, perhaps we're using standard fertilization, we're use, or, the, or I'm sorry, not fertilization, um, uh, uh, pollination. Um, so where the genes come together completely on their own. Um, and it uses the process of selection. We've talked about selection in previous videos um, and how it all works. Genetic engineering is a little different because it's not bringing things together that are similar. It's bringing together things that are different, things that would normally not combine in nature. Genetic engineering mixes genes of different species. Uh, and it works with genetic material in the lab. We just described how that's done in the previous slide. And it directly creates novel. Novel is a college term that means new, something that's never been seen before, something that is really um, uh, wouldn't have come together if it wasn't created by human beings. Uh, so it directly creates novel combinations of genes, things that would not have happened in nature. Okay, And in a lot of ways, it resembles the process of mutation. We are basically mutating DNA in ways that we like it by combining it with other things. Here's an example of this. This is a 2002 experiment that was photographed. These are where Caltech scientists combined mice with uh, uh, or they affected these mice, mutated them, by injecting single-celled mouse embry embryos with a virus that contained a jellyfish gene for green fluorescence. So these are glowing mice. Um, and they've done this with cats, and I believe they've done it with, with monkeys and stuff. And you might say, why? what might be the value in that? Is there any value in this? Well, if you're able to take something like, um, to, to engineer a... a a medicine that can target, say, cancer to glow, then that might help a surgeon remove that cancer um, as opposed to cutting out entire portions of the organ where they can actually do it nice and clean. If you could, if you could genetically modify the medicine just so that it makes only the cancer cells light up. So that might be one application that we're talking about here. But generally speaking, this was an experiment that was done just to see if they could do it. In terms of how important it is, it's it's a big deal what's going on in the world. When I was a kid, most of the food was not genetically modified. It was very difficult to get these things. Now it's everywhere, and it's big business. Um, globally, in 2012, 17 million farmers grew genetically modified foods on 420 million acres, which is 170 million hectares. That's 11% of all cropland. In the United States, it's more pronounced than that. 90% of U.S. corn, soybean, cotton, and canola are genetically modified plants. And most genetically modified crops are herbicide and pesticide resistant. Well, that should be good, right? So if we can modify things, they, you can make them herbicide and pesticide resistant. That means that you can wipe out all the weeds in a field and it won't. And by putting that, that poison or that herbicide or that pesticide out in the field, it'll only kill the things that you want it to kill. It won't kill the crop. Right. And so large scale farmers really like it. You know, they grow crops really efficiently by doing this. And so when we look over here, this is the data for the adoption of genetically engineered crops in the U.S. between 2000 and 2014, which is the data that I had available to me. Uh, from 2000, the amount of corn was just over 20 percent um, in terms of, let's see here, soybeans is green. So that's about 50% and cotton was about 60%. And we can see that all three of these trend lines have moved almost up to 100%. So it's between 80 and, and 100, looks like in some of these cases, about 95%. Um, that's a lot of cropland that is being grown in genetic modification or genetically modified soybeans, cotton, and corn. Um, in terms of how it's being adopted, so this is the adoption of genetically engineered corn in the U.S. What are we using it for? Well, if we're, well, let's look at what these things here. HT indicates herbicide tolerant varieties. BT indi uh, indicates insect re uh, resistant varieties. So originally they used the HT variety. This is the herbicide tolerant only. And that went up for a while and that's kind of gone out of favor. 
they're not using that as much anymore. Instead, they've stacked it. That seems to be the more common response, which is where they do both the BT and the HT, which is to say both the insect resistance and the herbicide resistant uh, varieties of corn in this case. And the same thing also happened with BT only, right? So we had HT only and BT only. They were both pretty prevalent until recently. Now the thing that is really taking over is the stack. It's the combination of the two. And that seems to be growing right up until uh, this very day. And of course, over here, this is the percent of planted acres. Overall, the gap between here and here it looks like it's about 80% of all acres are stacked BT and HT on um, corn. And of course, uh, the benefit to the farmer is they don't have, have to use as, or they don't have to worry about the, the weeds and the pests affecting their large crops, their, their, their monocultures. So if farmers are using genetically modified foods, there must be a reason, there must be a benefit. And there are benefits, right? We just mentioned one of them. There's the increased yield with lower costs. It's very inexpensive to use genetically modified corn. It's really expensive to use a lot of weed killer. Um, decreased irrigation, deforestation, land conversion, you get more efficient yields, right? You don't require as much water. Sometimes these things are genetically modified to be water and drought uh, resistant. Um, reduced, uh, reduced production of greenhouse gases through increased no-till farming. And in fact, we're seeing a lot of, a lot of farms engaged in no-till farming. Um, and we've talked about the benefits of that in previous um, videos. Uh, it reduced the use of chemical insecticides since, since plants produce their own insecticides like Bt. So believe it or not, there is corn that now exists. It's not just corn, but cotton and soybeans that produce their own insecticides. This has been taken from a bacteria that produces its own insecticide. That, that bacteria has, um, the, the gene for that has been passed into the plant. So the plant basically drives off the, its own pests using the insecticides from the bacterium. Um, in India, BT cotton increased yields with less chemicals. And of course, plants are made herbicide resistant, so less herbicides are used. But th there's a major issue, right? Which is that you're using herbicides. If you're on organic, uh, uh, an on organic farm, you're not using any herbicides at all. And here, the plants are producing the herbicides on, you know, for free, but they're producing it on the farm. Um, so studies are showing increased use of herbicides since plants can withstand the high doses. And what we're seeing is, is there's a, you know, a genetic arms race that's kind of playing out as the weaker varieties go away, the stronger ones continue to evolve and try to keep up with these changes. So as a consequence, biotechnology is always having to um, deal with these constant modifications. So that leads us to the question of what are the impacts of genetically modified foods? So as genetically modified crops expand, scientists, citizens, and policy, policymakers become concerned about impacts of human health, but support of this has been elusive. Um, there have been a lot of studies done. Uh, it does sometimes look like we've got uh, certain genetic modification problems that might have a, a, a human health impact that we need to be concerned about. And then another group of scientists will come in and say, well, maybe it's not as bad as we think, and maybe it can't be attributed directly to the genetic modification. So we're still kind of dealing with this. There's a, there's a lot of ethics about this, or ethical questions about this, which is, should we be using genetic modification of plants, not knowing what the effect is going to be on the overall ecosystem? And what are those concerns? Well, the ecological concerns uh, really over escaping transgenes. Right, these things, uh, these things, these plants uh, and animals, when they're when they've been modified, they do try to reproduce with the environment. They they pollinate with uh, native plants in the area if they happen to be of a similar species, um, and so as a consequence, they could harm non-target organisms, things that you don't expect. Another thing that can happen is pests could evolve resistance to these plants, especially the BT or the uh, or the HT corn. Um, they could ruin the integrity of native ancestral races and interbreed with closely related wild plants. Remember we talked about that a couple of lectures back. We talked about native Mexican corn where the land races were completely changed by genetically modified organisms that were coming from the United States. And those are even now in the native plants that are growing in the area. So it's very difficult now to go, a find, go and find a pure non-genetically modified organism, even 
out in, in the wild in some of these situations. And so a lot of uh, activists uh, preach something called the precautionary principle. This is the idea that one shouldn't undertake a new action until the effects of the action are understood. Um, and that's one of the big concerns. In the United States, we are just filling field after field with genetically modified corn, and possibly that corn is having a, a dire ecological effect, but it's unknown. So does that mean that we shouldn't do it? Maybe the evidence is that it isn't a problem, right? You know, we're, we're gonna know these things as the years go by, and we're gonna start seeing the effects either in our health, or we're gonna be seeing it in the land. There's going to be some effect that will be measurable, and then we will know whether or not it's genetic, the genetic modification is somehow at fault or not. So the public debate over genetically modified foods, we call it again GMOs, uh, it continues, and it's going to continue probably for as long as we all live. Uh, there are ethical and economic rather than scientific concerns that have largely driven the public debate. People don't like tinkering with the food supply. They don't like the idea that an apple isn't genetically 100% an apple. It might have a little bit of a bacterium or a little bit of an organism, or maybe you're holding a mouse with a little bit of glowing jellyfish gene in it, right? This is something that people really don't have a high level of tolerance for. They, they don't really like it. Um, with increasing use, people are forced to use genetically modified products or go to special effort to avoid them. In other words, they have to completely change their lifestyle, go organic, for example. Now, critics say multinational corporations threaten the small farmer. This is another big one, right? Genetically modified foods are used largely by the mega corporations, the very large uh, corporations that are producing the grain and the meat that is eaten by most people across the world. Um, and they, they argue that this genetic modification does threaten the small farmer who doesn't do those things or not, doesn't do those things nearly as much. Uh, research is funded by corporations that profit if genetically modified foods are approved for use. So this is another thing that tends to happen, in a, especially in the United States, is, is that a lot of the research is conducted by those very same ones that seek to, to benefit by the adoption or the acceptance of that particular food into the, into the, uh, into the uh, market. Um, approval decisions may not match environmental impact statement findings. Uh, there was a big issue with genetically modified sugar beets, for example, on this. Uh, what we see over here are apples. These are all genetically modified apples that we could see at a store. They're beautiful, they're edible. You can see that there's no little bite marks on here from bugs, there's very few blemishes. They actually transport really well and they're fairly easy to grow. And in and of itself, it just sounds like a wonderful thing to have on the table. But again, people will ask, well, if bugs are not willing to eat these apples, then why should humans be willing to eat them? You know, those are the kinds of questions that a lot of people ask. In terms of the public debate, there's been a lot of lawsuits about it. And a lot of the stuff stems from patent protection on transgenes. So corporations patent transgenes and protect them. So if you invent something, whether it be, you know, even the wheel or a computer or something, you invent it and you get it patented, uh, you own that. That becomes your intellectual property. The same is true, it turns, of, uh, turns out, about genetics. Uh, transgenes can be patented. Uh, Monsanto, who is a huge food producer, actually they're a seed company, uh, so they're not necessarily the food producer, they're the, they provide the seeds to farmers who produce the food. Uh, Monsanto has launched 145 lawsuits against several hundred farmers for having transgenes in their fields without buying them from Monsanto. In other words, this is where we've seen uh, reproduction uh, from, or, or, or well, I should say the reproduction is, is where we're seeing pollination of a of one field blowing in, that pollen blowing into another field, and then those genes manifesting themselves in a neighbor's field. Well, technically that is Monsanto's property. And so that's become a major issue. The question is, if it blows over into the neighboring field, um, is that farmer still able to use? It's a very complicated situation. In fact, I'm, almost, I'm way oversimplifying the problem. Um, in fact, here we see a caption of a, one of the, the most famous early farmers that tried to sue um, about this this is uh his name is vernon hugh bowman uh yeah, vernon bowman uh, mounted an unsuccessful challenge of seed patents that protect monsanto and other crop, uh, crop developers so there's widespread concern that exists that genet that organic foods will be contaminated by genetically modified plants 
And then once that happens, you can no longer call them organic and then you just lose the crop. So there's a lot of concerns about this. Um, and, you know, you can see why people are kind of up in arms over how it's done. Now, there's some interesting links about this, and, and I just think that you should check them out. The question of seedless watermelons, are they genetically modified, or are they not? But it's what it is, is a very interesting application of biotechnology, and it's very simple biotechnology. Um, so check out that link. I think you're going to enjoy it. And the other one is Monsanto. You know, I, I, I don't work for Monsanto. Uh, I actually don't know anybody that does. But Monsanto has done a, uh, has been in the media quite a bit talking about their views on the ethics of genetic modification of food and how it's brought to market. And so the chairman of Monsanto actually went on to a new show and was asked some very tough questions and gave uh, some interesting answers. And you can ask yourself whether or not he answered them to your satisfaction. So go ahead and click on that link when you get the chance. All right, well, thanks for listening to this. It was enjoyable. Biotechnology and genetically modified, genetically modified food, um, it's a really interesting conversation. It's an interesting ethical debate, but the chances are you're eating it right now. Unless you're on a completely organic diet, you're eating genetically modified food, especially if you live in the United States. Um, think about that. And when we get into the next video, we're going to be talking about some something entirely new. We're going to get away from food and we're going to get away from soils and all this. And we start wrapping up some of these important concepts of how ecosystems actually operate. All right, we'll catch you in the next video. Take care.